Katrina Belf, uh, you are a lot like Claire in the sense that you have almost, I think the parallel is fascinating. It's as if you've been transported to this magical world where you were this, this workaday actress who suddenly um, imaginably, unimaginably famous because this show Outlander has become such a huge cult hit. Do you feel a little bit like, like Claire? Um, well, I think I spent so many days last year playing her, I feel a lot like Claire. Um, <laughs> but I mean, but I, it's, uh, given your background, because you were a model and then you were an uh, actress, but uh, you've certainly never been in something like this before. No, no, this has been very special. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely been parallels. You know, I, I keep joking with Ron that, because uh, they cast me so late, and then I just got sort of sent to Scotland with three days to pack my bags and uh, you know all of a sudden I was thrown into the Outlander world and, and in a sense as confused and as, uh, as, as, as Claire was finding this world also new so was I and, and you know it's, it's nice in that way it's kind of a nice little parallel that we have together. And this show is not just a hit, it's this international sensation. You know, when we posted just a little item on you the other, the other day, within about 90 minutes we had 11,000 people storming that one item. Uh, there are very few people that get that kind of response. Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch does, in case you're wondering, people who run websites, you know, no, you're up there. In league with. No, I'm <laughs> That's the kind of cult status that you have here. What, what do you think is behind, I have my own theories and I'll share them in a minute, what do you think is behind the extraordinary reaction to Outlander that people are having? Well, I think first and foremost, most of the fans um, have come from Diana's books. And, you know, she sold over 25 million copies worldwide. So there was this great built in audience there already. Um, but we were very fortunate that they've really responded to the show and they've, they've sort of transferred their love onto us. And, and, you know, we feel very grateful for that. But I think it's just. It's this really beautiful love story at the heart of the show, but I think it's also a lot about, you know, adversity or strength in the face of adversity. And, and I think a lot of people in this day and age, they feel displaced or they're going through trials and tribulations and, and they find solace in these kind of characters that are so strong and just never lie down and, and keep fighting. And I think that that's a really beautiful thing that people relate to. There's something extraordinary about the TV adaptation, and I think it starts with the absolute genius of using the same actor for Frank and for <laughs> and for uh, uh, Blackjack. Who came up with that brilliant idea? I guess it must have been Ron. I think all credit has to go to him. But you know, Tobias is just fantastic, and I think you know, in the hands of someone a little less skilled, it might not have been pulled off so well. But he's just so wonderful because he brings this great um, gentle charm to Frank and, and then this absolute sadistic, without getting too arch, you know, or, or making it, you know, too comical with, with Blackjack. And he's really, really fantastic. So, yeah, they, they did such a good job with that because it's, it's so great with Claire because she constantly, even though she comes up against Blackjack so often, she, she finds it so hard to believe that she can't reach this shred of humanity that she believes is through him because of her husband. So she, even though she kind of sees his, his evil over and over again, she just always feels like she has to be able to reach this human part within him, you know? And when she sees his evil and sees Frank's face on his, in a way, and this is this is the, the many little psychological games that the show plays so well. And, and I know it's perverse to say this, but in a way, in Claire's mind, she's given permission to have this other husband because the one she's looking at is so evil. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's just it's creepy, but it, there's a little bit of that in there. I think yeah, I think Diana was very smart in, in the way that she crafted these storylines and these characters that that constantly run in and around each other but then it's also this thing of there's slightly the permission given but also there's a constant reminder of Frank so even though she's fallen in love with this other man it's never that simple and it's never that clear cut because she's constantly reminded of, of this husband that, that she's left or you know been separated from you know it's, it's so it's it's great in that way it's it's just it constantly 
it has these nice complicated layers to play with. Right. And and the husband that she's left behind, Frank, is 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 a good person, and that's what's so uh, great about the. Uh, the, the challenges of enjoying the show and following it is, you know, we're, we're told that, that, that human beings are monogamous creatures and that we are best uh, uh, paired with one person, but we know that, that the human heart is more complicated than that and, and our, our brains are more complicated than that. And so we may be instinctively uh, bred and evolved to be this way. We are all, we're also this way. And so what the, what the show does by not making Frank bad or or the rest of it by, by by giving her these two wonderful men in her life uh, lets us explore all that those things too it's just uh, how the whole show is structured is just wonderful that way yeah I mean it's, it's really interesting to play as an actress because you know I mean I think it happens very often in life uh, you know you're you're leaving one person and even if, if that relationship has, has ended, in your heart there's still love for that person and, and you meet someone new and it's not like everything is forgotten from your past and you just go with a whole heart to the next thing. There's always this, this overlay or there's always a pull and a tug of, of past things and I, and I think that's, you know, some fans get very defensive of Jamie and how could you possibly be thinking of Frank at this moment? And, you know, I think human beings, like you said, we're just we're very complicated, and the matters of the heart are very, never very simple. And it's nice to play with that, and it's nice to to be allowed. You know, I think the writers have been really great, where they've allowed the the love story with Jamie and Claire to evolve very slowly, and and allow Claire to have the space to sort of I don't know discover those complications or or. And or deal with those complications in a in a nice kind of elongated way. So now, when this show first came on the air, and the American journalists were writing about you, they all they all had a, a similar uh, thought, which was that that uh, in a way, your most powerful scenes are when you say nothing at all, when you're looking across a moor or a bog, or your and I when I started looking back at your history, I thought. And I'd like to know your thoughts on this. Is this where your modeling world probably came in handy? Because in other words, if you're just up on a on a runway and, and you're not allowed to talk and you're limited in the way you're allowed to walk and you're supposed to stand, you still want to cast some kind of aura, some personality, some some thought out there. And I think that when you do that as an actress, limited in a way whenever they're, you're observing action or a heartbreaking scene or something, I think it's... There's something extraordinary about that. Where do you think that comes from? Well, I think, you know, I started off uh, studying theater before I ever became a model. And I sort of fell into that world. And I think when I was modeling, you know, there was always the frustrated actress within me. And I think so many times when I was working, you, you know, you, you would try and find a way to make it more interesting for yourself. So there was always those moments on shoots where you would, you know, try and imbue it with a character or a story in your head, and you know, maybe that's where I sort of developed that, I don't know, in, interior monologue a little stronger or something. But um, you know, I just I, it's it's such a compliment when people say that you know they can see the thoughts in your in your in your face, and and you know, I think with Claire, she just didn't have anyone to confide in, and so much of it is is about what she's thinking internally and and there's only so much you can do with it with the the voiceover in that sense and so I think it was very important to try and convey you know what she might not be able to say to the other characters around her no it did it really comes through so uh, bravo to you on all of that now let's talk about that when you're for example in the episode where uh, where you know that the Jacobin uh, army is going to come to ruin and you try to dissuade these people from entering harm's way, you enter these kind of science fiction problems that stories have, which is you don't want to influence the action because it may alter history, and then, and then you might not be there, and you might vanish. But, uh, <laughs> but it's a, kind of a fun element to play with in terms of plot, isn't it? Mm. No, definitely. Um, you know, I, I think with Claire, she, you know, she's very becomes very fond of these people. She falls in love with this country and, and, and the people who've become her family in a sense. And, you know, it, it's that thing of, well, how do I save these people without perhaps, 
<laughs> you know, destroying myself or destroying, you know, who knows what, what the ripple effect would be. So, you know, it's it's just, again, I think it's what makes this story so exciting and poses these questions of, you know, what does happen if you change the course of history, you know? Um, and we will see in, in successive seasons what does happen. So, Well, it's absolutely painful what STARS is doing in the United States, how it just kind of dribbles out these little episodes, and it's just wait till the spring to see the next eight. I know, oh. it's, <laughs> it's brilliant, actually. It's absolutely brilliant. And now a season two, ha a, new, a, a second set of uh, is it 16 or 13 episodes have been greenlit for beyond all of that, too. Yeah, 13. 13. Which we haven't started filming yet, but... So let's talk about filming. Uh, what's a typical day like, and, and, and where do you shoot? And I'm sure fans would love to know all that. Um, well, you know, our schedule is, is, is very intense. Um, we shot for about 10 months last year. Um, so typical day, you know, depending on whether we're on location or inside, but, you know, usually we'll start at about 5, 5.30 a.m., and it's usually about a 14, 15-hour day. Um, wow. All inclusive, so it's it's pretty full on. Um, they had a lovely thing in, in Scotland when we first uh, started shooting where we were doing 11-day fortnights, so that's... Uh, a six-day week followed by a five-day week, which um, after about five months of that, we all were like, we're going to die. Um, but no, it's it's you know it's so beautiful shooting in Scotland, and I think that's one of the you know as you see the show, you really understand that it's and it's it's such a rich country and it, in in terms of its landscapes and its heritage, and they've been amazing the way they've preserved all of that as well so when we're shooting in places from the 1700s and, and you know we're at a castle from that time luckily you're able to go in Scotland and, and find a perfect castle that exists from that time period um, so I yeah I mean the weather has been one of the more challenging aspects of shooting here oh yeah what's uh, that like well <laughs> We were shooting yesterday uh, a photo shoot uh, outside, and it's, you know, a lot of the time you're in a cloud. You know, it's just, it's, <laughs> it's rainy, it's cold, but you still have to shoot. And it, and it gives it a great moody quality, but uh, that's quite difficult. And it got dark today, I think, at about 4 p.m. So when you're talking about it gets light around 9.30 p.m. or 9.30 a.m. So the days during the winter very short and trying to shoot in that is you know you're constantly up against the clock and I'm sure you don't shoot everything in a linear way right it's not all scenes are consecutive from the way you see them in the script you have to juggle juggle that around so a bit right we shoot two episodes together in a block um, usually we'll do that within five weeks so it's about 25 days for each block and um, you know, within that, we'll jump around, but they try to do they try to do as much as possible, you know, as as in in a linear fashion. But you know, it depends on locations, it depends on the sets, you know, different things like that. So, yeah, it it varies all the time. And how much uh, advanced time do you get with a script before you have to perform it? Um, it depends as well. Uh, the writers are usually pretty good at trying to get us a draft. I mean, it won't be the final draft, but, you know, a couple of weeks beforehand. But, you know, sometimes there's not a lot of rewrites. Sometimes there's rewrites going on up until the day before. <laughs> you know, I think very, very rarely has it ever happened that there's some rewrites on the day. Um, but, yeah, it's, you know, the, I think... This, you know, when we first started, we had probably the first four, the first four scripts of the first four episodes when we started. So that was really nice because you had a good lead up. But then, you know, as we're going, the writers are, are writing as we're shooting, and they're also writer producers, so they have to be on set. So you know, with the time constraints, sometimes the lead-ins towards the end can get a little shorter. Uh, we have a chat room open here, and Kathy in the chat room wants to know what you are looking forward to in the upcoming episodes of season two. I know that's a bit away, but uh, you do know where the books are taking you. What is there, is there a certain place you're going to travel to you're looking forward to? or 
Well, in, in season two, in, the, in book two, you know, there's a lot of it happens in the French court, which unfortunately <laughs> we're not going to France. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to Paris. I'm not sure where we'll end up, but uh, you know, I think we all we all got very excited about the fact that we'd end up in Paris. But Paris of today doesn't look like Paris from then, so we won't be there. But um, I used to live in France uh, a couple of years ago, so I'm very excited to sort of I don't know be at the French court and look all fabulous. That'd be fun. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. What uh, little stories can you? Tell us about shoot. Nothing ever goes according to script when you shoot a TV show or a movie. Uh, there is uh, the weather you mentioned sometimes can mess things up. A, a set can fall down, uh, and it's just kind of fun to know uh, those kinds of of, of things. Uh, what, what what little tales can you tell from behind the camera? Oh God! From what happened this season? Um, trying to think if there's anything. Oh, I hate I hate being put on the spot with this one. It's one that people ask you what are the funny things that happen on set, and I feel like we end up laughing all the time. And as soon as somebody asks you that, you're like, I've no idea. Um, I mean, there's well, actually, so the picnic scene that we did uh, with Hugh Monroe that day, we were in a cloud, and and you know we're supposed to be sitting there, Jamie and Claire, on a you know, mountainside, having this romantic picnic, and it was raining so hard that between each take, the props men were lifting up our plates, which had a, you know, piece of bread and cheese on it, and pouring the, the rain water off it, and then putting it back down. And everyone on the crew was like, that Jamie, you know, if, if that was my boyfriend and he made me sit outside in the rain, you know, we'd, we'd have, you know, gotten rid of him. But that was quite a funny day. Um, and that was actually Sam's birthday as well. And in the middle of the the take, uh, Hugh, the actor that plays Hugh Monroe just kind of started singing "Happy Birthday to Sam," much to his complete confusion. So that was quite funny. <laughs> That's pretty good. Do you have a favorite scene or, or scenes from uh, the first season? Um, there's a couple coming up in in sort of the second half of the season that were myself and Laura Donnelly had a lot of fun. She plays Jenny Fraser. Um, so I think anyone who's who's read the book, I hope, you know, I don't think I'll be giving away too much, but uh, there's a childbirth scene that was very very fun to film, and uh, and Laura and I just had great. We we had a couple of days on horses where we we thought we were in our own female western, which was really good fun. So I was looking. I'll, I'll be looking forward to seeing them. Well, uh, we're going to wrap up here. Uh Sorry about the technical delays we had at the start. <laughs> we we have our own stories to tell. <laughs> have our own stories to tell of technical problems doing this shoot here. Uh, but congratulations on the show. It's it's absolutely wonderful for stars, for you, for the books, for the fans, and it's great to just see it come together so triumphantly. Oh, thank you so much, Tom. It's been really lovely chatting to you. Same here. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye.